Shalom, everyone. <laughs> All right. I was about to say Shabbat Shalom. You know, <laughs> just to... <laughs> welcome to Tuesday Night Tour Study. Woohoo! All right, all right. Well, it's good to see all of you, have all of you here, uh, especially the two new additions uh, <laughs> on the live stream desk. <laughs> My wife, Shauna, and uh, Mercy are on the live stream desk, so this is their first time by themselves, so keep them in prayer. <laughs> we appreciate them stepping up. We also have... Uh, Shamish Kurt is on there as well, and we also have Shamish Gary and Shamish uh, Waffle in the house, so I appreciate them. And we also have Reverton, Joanne, and Reverton Julie here tonight. So excited for that. Amen. And last but not least, let me take my phone out because I almost forgot about him, and he's probably already sent me a message. We have Rabbi Steve. On the camera, so hi, Rabbi. He's watching, Rabbi Steve is online watching. So I'm sure he'll be in the chat room as well. Awesome. So we wanna start off our tour study tonight with prayer. Any prayer needs and praise as we normally do each and every Tuesday and on Shabbat. So if you have a prayer or praise, I'm gonna ask you to come up to the podium uh, and Mr. Paul Rippey will hand you the mic. And when you're done, you can just hand it back to him. So. All right, Shamish Waffle will start us off. HH2. HH2. There you go. It's there. All right, a lot of things going on. Court hearing reminder is the 14th for the custody. It's one of the first of the three. And then the landlords decided to take possession of the house with family, so now I have to move, so pray that I could find something because it seems to be impossible. And pray for, prayer for work. I mean, we can certainly do that. I know there's a lot of needs uh, in the area for people moving here and for housing. That is a huge need, so we continue to pray for that as well. All right, Ms. Dodson, Ms. Nell. I want to praise the Lord because I have such a great neighbor. She's the best chef on the street. So she's been making things and always calling me to come and get them. Strawberry and cake, chocolate, spaghetti and meatballs. And today she called and said, hey, my brother's here. Can he mow your lawn? So <laughs> I'm really blessed. And I thank the Yeshua for that and Yahweh God. So thank you. Oh, man, that's a... Awesome surprise, awesome blessing, I mean. Shamish Gary? So I want to give praise to Abba. We had the trip up to Ohio and um, good time with Rabbi and the leadership there. Um, got a lot accomplished and some good things happened there. And we um, got back safely, but continued prayers for us to get over things from Ohio down here because it's not only housing here, but it's U-Hauls because everybody's moving somewhere evidently. So you cannot, I mean, it's almost impossible. And um, just praise Abba for the provision because um, Stephen Clearman at uh, M2R Urbana, his dad was very gracious and allowed me to store our stuff at his garage. Where we wouldn't have been able to put it anywhere. So I want to just thank Abba for that and um, good to be here. Amen, amen, amen. Anyone else here? None of the guys up top, okay. Oh, Esther? Uh, an unspoken prayer for myself and one for my husband as well. Thank you. Amen. Amen. All right. Live stream. Are you ready? You need me to stall. Stretch it out. <laughs> Come on, guys. On live stream, we need you guys to start typing in. All right. We got Justin here. Uh, I just want to give a praise report. Finally, Father gave us a place to rent for a year. So we found a place. Um, it's beyond a blessing that I could ever imagine. It's literally right across the street over here. So literally Woo! right across the street. <laughs> so we can walk back and forth. It's pretty awesome. So uh, it's close to our property, everything. It's, yeah, I don't know. I can't ask for anything else. Uh, I'm beyond humbled and blessed by it all. So praise Abba. 
<laughs> Amen. Amen. So huge praise for, for Justin. Uh, he was here and he bought a new lawnmower that uh, our facilities guy was hoping to have and get. And so Abba blessed us with someone who went and bought one and uh, we used it today. Well, he used it. He came to volunteer. He bought the thing and came to use it on the property and did an amazing job. It looks phenomenal out there. So thank you as well for that huge blessing. And thank you, Reverend Joanne. I was about to say something, but you got up. <laughs> All right, so I was waiting for Reverend to get up. Um, but I got a phone call today, uh, and apparently Steve got one too. <laughs> that was great timing, Steve. That was great. That was great timing. Uh, so for you, for you guys who didn't hear, as soon as I said that, Steve phone rang. So it was, that was really cool. Special effects. I'm sure that was planned. Not. <laughs> but uh, I was home, and uh, I got a phone call from Roberts and Joanne that said on my, on my phone, only to, to remember that I didn't change the name. It's actually Rabbi Tom's cell phone, not Roberts and Joanne's. And it was Rabbi Tom on the other end, and he was very happy and excited to tell me that he was coming home on tomorrow. <laughs> Woo! So we're all super excited, and I'm, I'm grateful that we didn't get a call to the, the local police department because he broke out. <laughs> he escaped. Um, but he did want me to let you guys know that he's coming home. But most importantly than that, he is doing well. He sounds great. He's asking. He's begging. He's pleading. Please, no phone calls. Please, super, super, super please, no visitors. He doesn't want any phone calls. He doesn't want any visitors. He really needs to regain his strength. And I know everybody loves him and can't wait to squeeze him and high five him and all that. Um, but he's asking, please just pray for him. He has a wonderful caretaker, uh, actually two wonderful caretakers. And then he has three over here, uh, Rabbi, myself and, and George will also help him if needed. Um, but he's asking, and I can't say it strongly enough, please do not call him and definitely by no means go to his house and just show up and visit. He will be very upset and we will be very upset because he's asked and I can't express enough how much he made that known to me today. <laughs> please do not do that. So we made the announcement last time he came home and guess what? People didn't listen. They called and they showed up. It doesn't matter. There's no exception to the rule unless your name is Rabbi Steve. He said no. Say he means no. So please be respectful of Rabbi Tom and not call him and don't show up. You see rabbits in every week. So if you have any message or anything for him, you can gladly give it to her and she'll give it to him. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much. All right. Bubba. Amen. Amen. <laughs> amen. Have a uh, praise. Um, you know, we weren't here Shabbat. Um, Laura's had some pain in her neck. I don't know what she did. She stretched. Saturday morning and something popped in there and she was having spasms and and um, so we didn't come. She stayed on the couch with ice and heat and ice and heat and ice and heat and ibuprofen and um, anyways she is doing better. She's actually able to get up and move around and uh, so we actually yesterday we actually went to the park and um, she enjoyed some sunshine but uh, just keep her in prayers. We got to uh, eventually get to a chiropractor or somewhere. And um, so, but just praise Abba that she's doing better. And um, I don't know if she's watching or not, but I love you, babe. Um, anyways, so that's uh, our praise. Ah, oh, man, certainly an awesome praise. Oh, we did get to see her and the kids today, so that was awesome. All right, live stream desk. Ready, fire, aim, okay. I think that's backwards. Okay, from Olivier Hoffman, praise Yah, my surgery went well today, and prayers for a quick and full recovery. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Stephanie Henderson, prayers needed for my friend and neighbor. She is losing her battle with cancer and needing comfort for family. Uh, Jeannie 
prayers, please, for my husband, Al. Too much to explain, but Abba knows. Thank you so much. Evangeline Agalasso prays for a very good weekend with family. Some unspoken prayers needed, please. Thank you. Arthur and Linda, a praise. Arthur's mother has been released from hospital. Thank you for all your prayers. Also, pray for Arthur and Linda, just not feeling well. Back to our roots. You, uh, please pray that Mike gets the job. We will know tomorrow or Thursday we could really use this. Thank you, Billy and Rabbi, for your help. Walk, walk softly upon the earth. Prayers for work for my husband and pain relief for me. A great, great to have Torah Tuesday as walking is too painful. Vaskin, continued prayers for Rabbi and M2I leadership, for the Australian family, and for my Marco Polo brothers and sisters. Prayers for Shalom for myself as we are in our fourth lockdown where I live. Okay. Kay Carrick, please pray uh, prayers for my husband for wisdom and discernment. Linda DeHaven, Praise for the gift of, to the body of the leadership at MTOI. You're all very much appreciated. Looking forward to the teaching tonight. Teaching tonight, excuse me. <laughs> Carrie Ann Worthy, prayer requests, please. Please continue to pray for me. My autoimmune disorder is so bad, I cannot sit down. And continued prayers for the needs of the body. Kelly Lutz, coming to Chattanooga area later this month. Prayers for safe travels and hopefully some opportunities to see some of the M2I family. Praise Abba, Abba for my husband's open heart to make his, this happen. <laughs> Donna Stevens, praise Yah for the peace and blessing that comes through a thought if his mighty name that I, a uh, prayer that I can find a job where I can help people and that my sister gets a good report of health from her doctor. Rob Wyatt, Shalom from out west. Daniel Most wanted me to thank each and every one, everyone for the prayers that she loves all of you. Peter and Debbie, prayer for lockdown was that four in Victoria for Abba's providence and health in these difficult times for so many people. Michelle Perez, praise Abba for my Emuna workout. My AC went out from 11 p.m. last night to 5 p.m. today, and I kept my shalom and had breathing issues today and still had joy in my trial. Uh, Claire Isaac, please keep my daughter in prayer. She is very angry. Carla Leon, praise Yahweh Elohim for the blessings, challenges, and tests we get from him. May he continue to have mercy on all of us. In Yeshua HaMashiach name I pray, amen, hallelujah. Uh, Karen Krut, Kraut, sorry, oh my gosh. Prayers for me that my disposition goes smoothly. Deposition. <laughs> uh, Donna Stevens, praise Yah for the unconditional love from MTOI staff and their help and support for Rabbi Steam. Oh my gosh, Rabbi Tom and everyone else, you all help. That is so amazing. It's really nice to see goodness in the world. Michelle Perez, prayers for Rabbi Steve's dad and for his safe travels. Peter and Debbie, prayer for work for all those who are seeking with me. Thanks to be Abba. Thanks be to Abba. Uh, Jeannie, don't like to ask prayer for me, but prayers to figure out why I have no energy by the end of the day. I can barely keep my eyes open or function. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. 
Lazarus um, praise report. Kristen and I have been married for three months now. I feel like we just got married a few days ago. <laughs> Ruth Ann Soros, prayers for my daughter's court date, been pushed out till next Monday, that the father allows the restraining order to be put in permanent effect for as long as needed. Evangeline Agalasso, continued prayers for Rachel's healing and their plan to move to Texas after the school year. Continued healing for Tony's medical issues and Zay. Deirdre Kasdorf, please continue to pray for our family as Freddie is better now, but now Eric, Alice, and I are sick. Rabbi Tom, please pray for my daughter, Judy. She has a stomach flu. And we're caught up. All right. I also want to mention, I didn't mention that he was watching, Rabbi Steve was watching, but uh, I do want to uh, have us continue to lift him up in prayer as he is uh, helping with his dad and I was fortunate enough to have a few phone conversations today and heard his dad in the background. And I was just laughing at Rabbi as he is helping his dad uh, and sounding like himself as a dad, as if he's talking to one of his kids. Uh, but it was very sweet uh, hearing him engage with his dad and be there to help and hear his mom so appreciative of him being there. So Rabbi, we love you. We wanna continue to lift him up for uh, while he's there and we thank Abba for his traveling mercies that allowed him to get there. He said his nine hour trip took him 12 hours with traffic and all that nonsense. And, uh, but he made it there safely uh, and he's still working even while he's there. Um, so that's how Rabbi is, he, it's always working. Um, so we praise Abba for him and uh, we continue to lift him up, especially for his safe return back here. So if I could have somebody to raise their hand uh, to pray also pray for the prayer requests. Um, we'll let Gary do it since, so we can get used to seeing him now. <laughs> so if you can pray for the prayer requests and also open up the door study, that'd be great. Vino Makeno, Father, we just I want to come before you and just thanking you and praising you for everything that you do for us. Father, lifting up the praises before you and also these prayers. Father, you've heard them all and we know that you have this all under your control and help us to lay them before you and um, have him and on and allow you to do what you do. And Father, we also want to um, thank you for this opportunity to come together as Mr. Kyle to come and hear your word to study and to open up uh, our eyes and our ears to see what it is that we can see in your Torah and apply it to our lives. Father, we thank you and we praise you, asking all this in the authority of Yeshua's name. Amen. 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 So. Tonight, we're going to start with the scripture readings, and after the scripture readings, we're going to come back and do some announcements. Um, tonight's going to be eight readings. Uh, the tour study is Shalak, numbers 13, 1 through 15, 41. There's going to be eight readings. We have eight, eight chairs if you want to start filling those up. Uh, Shalak means send, send. So the first reading. It's going to be Numbers 13, 1 through 16, and we have Paul, if you would step up. We're going to start with our traditional blessing. He will bless our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. May he bless Paul, he has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set-apart one bless him and his family and send blessing and prosperity on all the works of his hands. Amen. One through sixteen. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I am giving to the children of Israel. Send one man from each tribe of their fathers, every one a leader among them. And by the mouth of you, 
Yahweh Moshe sent them from the wilderness of Paran, all of them men who were heads of the children of Israel, and these were their names, from the tribe of Reuben, Shemua, son of Zechor, from the tribe of Shimon, Shaphat, son of Ori, from the tribe of Yehuda, Caleb, son of Yefune, from the tribe of Yisiskar, Yigal, the son of Yoshev, from the tribe of Ephraim, Hoshea, son of Nun, from the tribe of Benjamin, Palti, son of Rafu, from the tribe of Zebulon, Gedil, son of Sode, from the tribe of Yosef, from the tribe of Manasseh, Gadi, son of Susi, from the tribe of Dan, Amil, son of Gimali, from the tribe of Asher, Sh Shethur, son of Mikael, from the tribe of Naphtali, Nabi, son of Wolfshi, from the tribe of Gad, Giul, son of Maki. These are the names of the men who Moshe sent to spy out the land, and Moshe called Hosea, Hoshea, the son of Nun, Yehoshea. Amen, amen. Thank you, Paul. Next we have Michael. And Michael is going to read. I should have put all the notes up. We should just leave him there. Michael is going to read 17 through 33. All right, he who blessed our fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob may bless Michael, who has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the settled part one bless him and his household and his family and some blessing and prosperity in all the works of his hands. Amen. And Moshe sent them to spy out the land of Canaan and said to them, Go up here into the south and go up to the mountains and see what the land is like and the people who dwell in it, whether strong or weak whether few or many, and whether the land they dwell in is good or evil, whether the cities they inhabit, whether the cities they inhabit are in camps or strongholds, and whether the land is rich or poor, and whether there are forests there or not. And you shall be strong and bring some of the fruit of the land. Now the time was the season of the first fruits of grapes. So they went up and spied out the land from the wilderness of Tzin as far as Rehob, near the entrance of Hamat. And they came up through the south and came up to Hebron. And Ahiman, Sheshai, and Talmai, the descendants of Anak, were there. Now Hebron had been built seven years before Tzoan in Mitzrayim. And they came to the Wadi Eshkol and cut down from there a branch with one cluster of grapes and they bore it between two of them on a pole, also of the pomegranates and of the figs. That place was called the Wadi Eshkol because of the cluster which the men of Yisrael cut down from there. And they returned from spying out the land after 40 days, and they went and came to Moshe and Aharon and all the congregation of the children of Yisrael in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land and they reported to him and said, We went to the land where you sent us, and truly it flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. But the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are walled very great. And we saw the descendants of Anak there too. The Amalekites dwell in the land of the south, while the Hittites and the Jebusites and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea and along the banks of the Yarden. And Caleb silenced the people before Moshe and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are certainly able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel an evil report of the land, which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land eating up its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great size. And we saw there the Nephilim, sons of Anak, of the Nephilim. And we were like grasshoppers in our own eyes. And so were we, so we were in their eyes. Amen, amen. 
So now we have Janet, and she's going to read 14, 1 through 14. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Janet, who has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set-apart one bless her and her family and send blessing and prosperity on all the works of her hands. Amen. And then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. And all the children of Israel grumbled against Moshe and against Aaron. And all the congregation said to them, If only we had died in the land of Mizraim, or if only we had died in this wilderness. And why is Yahweh bringing us to this land to fall by the sword, that our wives and children should become a prey? Would it not be better for us to turn back to Mizraim? And they said to each other, Let us appoint a leader. Let us turn back to Mizraim. Then Moshe and Aharon fell on their faces before all the assembly of the congregation of the children of Israel. And Yehoshua, son of Nun, and Caleb, son of Yephuneh, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their garments. And they spoke to all the, the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, the land we pass through to spy out is an exceedingly good land. If Yahweh has delighted in us, then he shall bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which is flowing with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against Yahweh, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their defense has turned away from them, and Yahweh is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Then the esteem of Yahweh appeared in the tent of appointment before all the children of Israel. And Yahweh said to Moshe, How long shall I be scorned by these people? And how long shall I not be trusted by them with all the signs which I have done in their midst? Let me strike them with the pestilence and disinherit them and make of you a nation greater and mightier than they. And Moshe said to Yahweh, Then the mistress shall hear it, for by your power, you brought these people up from their midst. And they shall say to the inhabitants of this land, they have heard that you, Yahweh, are in the midst of these people. And you, Yahweh, are seen eye to eye, and that your cloud stands above them. And you go before them in a column of cloud by day and in a column of fire by night. Amen, amen. Thank you, Janet. Awesome reading. Next reading we're going to have... It's Brianna, Numbers 14, verse 15 through 30. No, I haven't memorized it yet. <laughs> he was blessed, our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. May he bless Brianna, who has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set-apart one bless her and our family and send blessing and prosperity on all the works of our hands. Amen. Now, if you kill these people as one man, then the nations which have heard of your report shall speak, saying, Because Yahweh was not able to bring this people to the land which he swore to give them, therefore he slew them in the wilderness. And now I pray, let the power of Yahweh be great, as you have spoken, saying, Yahweh is patient and of good, great loving commitment, forgiving crookedness and transgression, but by no means living, leaving unpunished, visiting the crookedness of the fathers on the generation, the children to the third and fourth generation. Please forgive the crookedness of this people according to the greatness of your loving commitment. As you have ever, as you, as you have forgiven this people from Mitzrayim even until now. And Yahweh said, I shall forgive according to your word. But truly as I live and all the earth is filled with the esteem of Yahweh, for none of these men which have seen my esteem and the signs which I did in Mitzrayim and in the wilderness and have tried me now these ten times and have disobeyed my voice shall see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor any of those who scorned me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me completely, I shall bring into the land where he, he went and his seed shall inherit it. Since the Amalekites and the Canaanites are dwelling in the valley, turn back tomorrow and set out into the wilderness by the way of the Sea of Reeds. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe and to Aharon, saying, How long shall this evil congregation have this grumbling against me? I have heard the grumblings which the children of Israel are grumbling against me. 
Say to them, as, as I live, declares Yahweh, as you have spoken in my hearing, so I do to you. The carcasses of you who have grumbled against me are going to fall in this wilderness. All of you who are registered according to the entire, your entire number from 20 years old and above. None of you except Caleb, son of Yefuni, and Yehoshua, son of Nun, shall enter the land which I swore would make, I would make you dwell in. Amen. Thank you, Brianna. Great job. Next, we have Miss Angelique, who will be reading chapter 14, 31 through 45. He, Angelia, I'm sorry. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Miss Angelia, who has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set apart one bless her and her family and some blessing and prosperity on all the works of her hands. Amen. But your little ones, whom you said would become a prey, I shall bring in, and they shall know the land which you have rejected. But as for you, your carcasses are going to fall in this wilderness. And your sons shall be wanderers in the wilderness forty years, and shall bear your whorings, until your carcasses are consumed in the wilderness. According to the number of the days in which you spied out the land forty days, a day for a year, a day for a year, you are to bear your crookedness forty years, and you shall know my breaking off. I am Yahweh. I have spoken. I shall do this to all this evil congregation who are meeting against me. In this wilderness they are consumed, and there they die. And the men whom Moshe sent to spy out the land who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing an evil report of the land... Even those men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before Yahweh. Of those men who went to spy out the land, only Yehoshua son of Nun and Caleb son of Yefuna remained alive. And when Moshe spoke these words to all the children of Israel, the people mourned greatly. And they rose up early in the morning and went up to the top of the mountain, saying, See, we have indeed sinned. But we shall go up to the place which Yahweh had spoken of. But Moshe said, Why do you now transgress the mouth of Yahweh, since it does not pro prosper? Do not go up, lest you be smitten by your enemies, for Yahweh is not in your midst. Because the Amalekites and the Canaanites there are, are there before you, and you shall fall by the sword. Because you have turned away from Yahweh, Yahweh is not with you. But they presumed to go up to the mountaintop, but neither the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh nor Moshe left the camp. So the Amalekites and the Canaanites who dwelt in that mountain came down and struck them and beat them down even to Hormah. Amen. Thank you so much. Next we have Chris. <laughs> All right, he who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Chris, who has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set-apart one bless him and his family and some blessing and prosperity upon all the works of his hands. Amen. You're going to read 15, 1 through 16. And Moshe spoke, I mean, and Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you have come into the land of your dwellings, which I am giving you, and you make an offering by fire to Yahweh, an ascending offering or a slaughtering to accomplish a vow or as a voluntary offering or in the, your appointed times to make a sweet fragrance to Yahweh from the herd of the flock. Then he who brings near his offering to Yahweh shall bring it near a grain of offering of one tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one fourth of a hin of oil and one fourth of a hin of wine as a drink offering you prepare with the ascending offering or the slaughtering for each lamb. Or for a ram you prepare as a grain offering two tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with one third of a heen of oil. And as a drink offering you bring one third of a heen of wine as a sweet fragrance to Yahweh. And you, and when you prepare a young bull as an ascending offering or as a slaughtering to accomplish a vow or as a peace offering to Yahweh, then you shall then shall be brought with the young bull a grain offering of three-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with half a heen 
of oil, and bring as the drink offering half a hin of wine, as an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Yahweh. This is what is done for each young bull, for each ram, or for each lamb or young goat, according to the number that you prepare, so you do for each one according to their number. Let all who are, are native do so with them in, uh, in bringing near an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Yahweh. And when a stranger sojourns with you or whoever is among you throughout your generations and would make an offering made by fire, a sweet fragrance to Yahweh, as you do, so he does. One law is for you of the assembly and for the stranger who sojourns with you, a law forever throughout your generations. As you are, so is the stranger before Yahweh. One Torah and one right ruling is for you and for the stranger who sojourns with you. Amen. Thank you, Chris. Next up, we have Grayson. He's going to read uh, uh, verse 17 through 29. He who blessed our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, may he bless Grayson, who has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set-apart one bless him and his family and send blessing and prosperity on all the works of his hands. Amen. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land to which I bring you, then it shall be, when you eat of the bread of the land, that you present a contribution to Yahweh. Present a cake of the first of your dough as a contribution. As a contribution of the threshing floor, you present it. Of the first of your dough, you are to give to Yahweh a contribution throughout your generations. And when you sin by mistake and do not do all these commands which Yahweh has spoken to Moshe, all that Yahweh has commanded you by the hand of Moshe, from the day Yahweh com gave command and onward throughout your generations, then it shall be, if it is done by mistake, without the knowledge of the congregation, that all the congregation shall prepare one young bull as an ascending offering, as a sweet fragrance to Yahweh, with its grain offering and its drink offering, according to the right ruling, and one male goat as a sin offering. Then the priest shall make atonement for all the congregation of the children of Israel, and it shall be forgiven them, for it was by mistake. And they shall bring their offering, an offering made by fire to Yahweh, and their sin offering before Yahweh for their mistake. And it shall be forgiven all the congregation of the children of Israel, and the stranger who sojourns in their midst, because all the people did it by mistake. And if a being sins by mistake, then he shall bring a female goat a year old as a sin offering. And the priest shall make atonement for the being who strays by mistake when he sins by mistake before Yahweh to make an atonement for him, and it shall be forgiven him. For him who does whatever by mistake, there is one Torah, both for him and who is a native among the children of Israel and for a stranger who sojourns in their midst. Amen. Thank you, Grayson. Well, last but not least, we have Mr. Rick Barry. He's going to read chapter, uh, verse 30 to the end of the chapter. Oh, well, to verse 41. He who blessed our fathers Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob may bless Rick, who has come up to honor Yahweh in the Torah. May the set-apart one bless him and his family and some blessing and prosperity on all the works of his hands. Amen. But the being who does whatever defiantly, whether he is native or a stranger, he reviles Yahweh, and that being shall be cut off from among his people. Because he has despised the word of Yahweh and has broken his command, that being shall certainly be cut off. His crookedness is upon him. And while the children of Yisrael were in the wilderness, they found a man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. And those who found him gathering sticks brought him to Moshe and to Aharon and to all the congregation. And they put him in under guard, because it had not yet been declared what should be done to him. And Yahweh said to Moshe, The man shall certainly be put to death, all the congregation stoning him with stones outside the camp. And all the congregation brought him outside the camp and stoned him with stones as Yahweh commanded Moshe, and he died. And Yahweh spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and you shall say to them to make tzitzit on the corner of their garments throughout their generations, and to put a blue cord in the tzitzit of the corners. And so it shall be to you for a tzitzit, 
and you shall see it, and shall remember all the commands of Yahweh, and shall do them, and not search after your own heart and your own eyes, after which you went whoring, so that you remember, and shall do all my commands, and be set apart unto your Elohim. I am Yahweh your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim, to be your Elohim. I am Yahweh your Elohim. Awesome reading. Thank you so much, Rick, and thank you to all of the readers for reading. Now a traditional blessing that is read after the reading of the Torah. Blessed are you, Yahweh our Elohim, King of the universe, who has given us the Torah of truth and has planned the eternal life in our midst. Blessed are you, Yahweh, giver of the Torah. Amen. Amen, amen. All right, now it's time for the announcements. First off, I want to welcome all of our guests. If this is your first time being with us, we do this every uh, Tuesday night. And I was going to say every Tuesday night at 8, but a great surprise that starting on next Shabbat, I mean next Shabbat, next Tuesday, next tour Tuesday, it's going to be at 6.30, so we can, huge praise for that. For, for all of you that have to be in bed by 8, mercy. No. <laughs> it's gonna, <laughs> we're going to start at 6.30 starting on next Tuesday, so we're super excited about that. I know many people are. So that's the first excitement, so we're going to have to change that slide. So Sorry, Marty. Um, and we live stream every Tuesday, so starting on next week, it'll be every Tuesday at 6.30. We'll be doing our tour study here at Beth Shalom, and we're excited about that. All right, next up, we have our Pasha Pearls program. Our Pasha Pearls can be found at ym2i.org. We have two programs in that program itself, Gem Seekers and Pearl Seekers for Katan Olive, which is ages 5 through 8, and Pearl Seekers, Katan Bet and Godol, which is 99 through Eternity. <laughs> it says 9 to 99, but uh, everybody can enjoy it. I know I definitely did, especially when we were at home live streaming. Uh, in there, you'll find child-friendly uh, friendly stories, lesson questions, Hebrew word studies, memory verses, word searches, crossword puzzles, puzzles mazes, crafts, notebook pages, coloring pages, songs, and of course, the theme snack to go along with the tour portion, which is really exciting. Um, and you can find that there. Robertson and her team does an amazing job putting that together for absolutely free. So we appreciate that so very much. Absolutely. You can find that at ym2i.org. Then we have our audio scripture readings by Ms. Shira Windling. And those are downloadable, found on our website, m2i.org. You can download them and listen to them throughout your day or at work or if you're able to listen to your headphones. And she's done just about all, except for about four, I believe. I know the camera guy's like, he's moving. Yes, sorry. Should be used to that, it's me. I move. Okay. <laughs> and I, don't, I know there's a few that she, I don't have my note. There's a few that uh, she still has yet to do, and she's taking a short break. Uh, but definitely visit the website, and everything that she has is there, and it's downloadable. And we're super excited for that. Next up, we have June 3rd. I don't know if you have this slide, but June 3rd is the last day of the M2I Academy. So we want to give a huge praise to Abba for that. One teacher, okay. And she's the principal's assistant. Uh, is excited about that. <laughs> That's June 3rd, uh, which is this coming Thursday. And then on June 4th, we have the M2I graduating class for 2021. Super excited for that. And all the kids that are moving up. They're gonna have a, a luncheon at 11 a.m. Um, and if you are an immediate family of any of the graduates, Robinson is asking, Robinson Julie is asking that you RSVP. Uh, and you already passed that deadline. So if you haven't did it, we're assuming that you're not coming because she's already got the count. Uh, so. Uh, June the 11th, we have our Arab Shabbat dinner and roast Kodesh service, so we're excited about that. I know we have a slide. There it is. It's also, um, well, the roast Kodesh, roast Kodesh is for Harivii, and we're going to do that at 6.30 for 
for dinner between 6, 6.30, you get here, we start dinner. And then around 8 o'clock, we're going to have the uh, start the Arab Shabbat service. So we're excited about that, that we get together to eat and to celebrate together. June the 12th is our Zone 2 Shabbat Q&A at 10 p.m. Eastern time with Rabbi Steve. So all of you that are in the United Kingdom, Europe, and that side of the world, uh, we get so excited to uh, join you guys for the Zone meetings. And it's primarily for those where the preference is given to those in those areas, but anybody can come. I strongly encourage anyone to come, especially if you want to see the work that Ab is doing through this ministry and through all of you guys' help here across the world. And it is truly an amazing, amazing thing to see and experience, especially if you're like me and didn't know that some of these places even existed, because I never heard of the names. It's, it's stupendous. <laughs> Then we have June the 18th, our Zone 3 Q&A with Rabbi, and that's at 10 a.m. And that's also Rabbi's birthday, which of course he wants nobody to know that his, <laughs> his birthday, and he doesn't like surprises, okay? So don't try to get him in here in his office before he shows up for work. Unless there's ice cream cake, Rabbi said bring all that and we'll make sure we eat it before he gets here. Okay, awesome. <laughs> so that's, <laughs> that's June the 3rd. So a correction, because my notes both have 10 p.m. So zone three is 10 p.m., June the 18th, which is a Friday, and zone two is 10 a.m. So correction there, it's 10 a.m., which is on our Shabbat uh, as well, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time before our Shabbat services. So um, that's correction there. Um, last but not least, if you have questions, Keep them to yourself because Rabbi Tom is out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Feel free to email questions, and, and many people do. Even uh, I saw a few come in today. If you have questions, uh, send those questions to uh, questions at m2i.org. If you have an immediate question that needs an immediate answer or it's an emergency or something like that, uh, we have several coming in about shots and so on and so forth, exemptions and those kinds of things. Please call in. Uh, if you send those questions there, we, we probably won't see them. Um, but send those questions, you know, definitely call us or email us, uh, use the appropriate uh, channels to do those kinds of things. I just want to put this out there because it happens. If you have my cell phone number, my work cell phone number, because I do have a work cell phone number, many people have it, that is not access for you to text me. I, you can call the number, leave a message, go through the proper channels, but that line is not available for you to text me. I, I, I promise you, if I saw it and I read it, I won't respond to it and then I'll forget about it. Michael can tell you because they text me sometimes and I always hit, please text me. Or if you call that number, my personal cell, well, my work cell phone number, if you call that number, I'm gonna tell you to text me. And then when you text me, I'm gonna tell you to email me. So if you just email me from the get go, <laughs> I'll get you on and I'll get it taken care of, okay? Unless it's an emergency and you people, and those of you who, uh, have access and you know permission to do that, by all means do that. Um, but sometimes our phone system goes down and I have to call from my uh, work cell phone and then people just, thinks, just think it's an invitation to call and text me whenever they want. That's not what it's for. And I started last week <laughs> to, to start blocking numbers for people that abuse that privilege. Uh, then I realized I can't. It's a work cell phone. So I'm, I'm making a public announcement that it's my work cell. <laughs> and, and I unblocked all those who I blocked before <laughs> for abusing that privilege. But we have a work number. We have work hours. Wow. I know a lot of people didn't know that. We do have work hours that we work, uh, which is Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Well, Monday through Thursday, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, on Friday, we come in 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Now, just because you see me here is because I work for Rabbi. And so we don't leave until the work is done. It doesn't mean that you, we're available when you just show up after hours to do whatever you ask us to do. Make an appointment unless it's an emergency. By all means, if it's an emergency, we will do our best to accommodate you. But just because you see us here after hours or before hours, before hours is not an invitation. I get in before hours before the phone starts ringing to try to get some stuff done because if any of you popped in at nine o'clock, you can see that my day takes on a mind of its own. And you know, I love all of you, but it's only one me and one rabbi and we're doing our best to 
to be our best to take care of everybody. So please be kind to our to accessing us, okay? All right. So I think that's it. Now this time, if you're on live stream, you can start typing in your questions, comments that you may have if you're in the house. We're going to rotate between live stream and the house. I'm actually, if we have anybody that wants to start off, we're going to try to go chronologically as possible. Anybody before Janet and Steve? Oh, Steve, where's Steve? I just want to give y'all an opportunity. Y'all know once they get, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> Uh, preemptively, I'm going to strike and say we're not talking about the Nephilim, okay? So just, I know, you, I know you figure, hey, Rabbi's not here. I can sneak in on Billy, but don't worry. He called me and sent me a few texts, and we had a conversation, and he said, hey, and if you don't want to answer anything, he said, just tell him that he'll answer when he comes back if I don't want to answer it, if I don't know the answer. So I'm super excited. You know, it's just easy now since I have a dollar friend feature on my phone. Okay. <laughs> All right. So who's going to go first? Comment or question? Any, anybody before Janet? Anybody? Chapter 13. Anybody? Oh, okay. Brianna. Brianna. Come on, Brianna. I'm messing with Janet. I'm messing with her because we love her. And she has 15 questions. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I don't know who's worse. Brianna says she's going to have something lined up for me. I'm, I'm kind of afraid. No, I'm not. I'm not. <laughs> All right, so the Nephilim. I'm just kidding. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, I don't, it's more of a comment. Okay. Um, but I do have a question that's later on, though. Um, but for 13 more, it's just a comment. Um, basically, it's like, he told them in the beginning of, before they even entered, what to expect. He, he told them. He, it was his words. Um, and he said that whether strong or weak or few or many, he told them, expect the unexpected. And then he said, be strong. So he told them. He laid down the whole foundation. And then they walked in there and were like, oh, this is kind of scary. But his words weren't enough for them but what they could see like in the few chapters back when they were talking about the onions and the leeks and the garlic that was something they could see they could taste that was something that they could remember being good but he gets to define what is good mm. so if this not looking so great like giant scary people um might not seem good but if he said that this was going to be good they should have trusted what he said. His word should have been enough. So, yeah. Wow. That's something, yeah. Amen. Amen. Well, Rabbi always says that we're supposed to look at the scripture readings as how we can apply it to our lives. And I think Brianna really summed up so we can all pack up and go home and say goodnight. I mean, I mean that's the whole point of this portion of scripture is do you trust him enough? He told you, he showed you, he brought you out, but yet we get out there and we fumble, you know, twiddle our thumbs and fumble. And really is a, you know, my favorite is just laziness that we don't want to get up and do because somehow we thought somebody else was going to do it. And the sad part is somebody else will do it. But will you get the benefit? Will you get the blessing? No. Most of us won't. Because we're not willing to do it. We'd rather sit and wait for somebody else to do it because we don't trust. We don't trust the process. We don't trust that he's bigger, that he's able to do anything but fail. And we just, we, we lose our blessing all the time. I remember asking a person, because I had an issue a while back, I'm still working on it, of receiving, of appreciate, receiving appreciation because I was appreciated and then stabbed in the back, which I'm sure all of us have experienced at some point or another in our lives. So I had an issue with receiving because I would always ask why. Oh, you did wonderful, why? Oh, I love you, why? You know, if you can't give me an answer, I'm gonna think you just pulled it out of the air. But I had to learn to trust him, and like Rabbi said a couple weeks ago, I had to learn to trust, just accept it, learn to receive. 
Sometimes we miss our blessings because we can't receive. Are you in a place in your life? Are you in a place in your head? Are you at a place within yourself to receive? And because we can't receive, a lot of times we can't, we won't get what we're standing in a need of because we can't receive it. We got a blessing, we want a blessing, but we can't take hold of it because we're not receiving it. So that was awesome. Do we trust him enough to receive? I mean, anybody else for 13? Oh. Well, you know, Craig got up. <laughs> he, he was in the bathroom when I said anybody other than Janet first. No, I'm kidding. You can go after him. I, I was teasing. Yes, you're welcome. And Steve is not here, so you can get double questions and comments, because Steve. Oh, never mind. Go ahead, Craig. No. <laughs> yeah, so in 13, two of these were leaders amongst the tribes that they sent out, um, 12 leaders, of which two of them had a different spirit, and 10 of them um, probably weren't worthy to be called leaders. Um, that's a pretty uh, hard thing, and the people, um, ultimately all of us, suffered for these 10 people and are likely still suffering um, from what um, we can see here we have to uh, really pay attention to the leadership that we're following um, the 10 that had an evil report that slandered um, yeah were leaders amongst the people um, they were men that likely were uh, lifted up, held praise, you know, um, had the special seat, special parking spots, got to eat the special meals, you know, and um, it's just really difficult and, and, and really sobering. I mean, I mean, Janet, you can go next. I was teasing. But point, uh, point well taken, uh, Craig. Is a leadership. We, we want leadership. We want the structure. We want to follow leadership. And a lot of folk, and I, I, I haven't figured out why yet, uh, they run to be in a place of leadership. They run to be in a place in front. And what I'm always looking at is, are you serving? Because that's where it starts. If you can't clean the toilets with me, if you can't come in in the morning with me at 8, and I did the teaching this past Shabbat, at, at night, I was... Robinson, me and, and Brianna was, and Janet, <laughs> were out mopping and cleaning, as many people were. But I came in, was one of the first to come in, if not the first. Yeah, I was actually the first here at 8 o'clock in the morning on Shabbat. And I was one of the last, if not the last, I locked the building. I was the last to leave. So I did the teaching and I did all that. And I'm not asking for a pat on the back. I'm just looking for those around me. Who was there? And it's usually the women. That's usually who's there. Some of the last of the last, and the Shamish, and you know, and they're Shamish because they were doing it before they were made Shamish, not because they started, you know, not because they were Shamish. And usually Steve is coming to ask me, hey, you need anything before I leave? And I really appreciate that, because that's what I'm watching. All the ones that, oh, I want to do this, I want to be this, I want to, you know, I want to do this, I want to, are you serving? It's amazing to me, I was talking to Marty a few weeks back, and he was saying how People come into the ministry, and it's great that they may have skills for audiovisual, but they come to run to that because I don't think it's easy at all, but they want to do that. But the same ones I have never seen clean a toilet, move a chair, break, put, set a table up, wipe a table down, move chairs for ONEG, but they want to be an audiovisual. But I think there should be a process. You can't just come in and get the job that seems important, as Craig said, this Seems very important to stand behind that camera. Intimidating for me, because I don't know how to work the machine, but I could learn, but perfect point. You know, everybody wants to be in front, but who's going to take the fall? Who's going to take the responsibility for making that wrong decision? It's one thing I admire about Rabbi. Rabbi can, can, can go hard, but that responsibility is going to fall on him at the end of the day. So I'm making sure as I serve him that I'm making every possible effort to be the best that I can be and to 
not do anything unless he approves it or makes that decision because I know it's going to fall on him at the end of the day. And guess what? Before I was the last one scrubbing the toilets or whatever it was, it was him. Before all of us came, it was him. He used to tell me how Robinson and him, and even the kids once they were little, were setting up and breaking down. And they did it for many, many years. So that's very true. Everybody wants to step up and they want to take responsibility, but nobody wants to serve. It's fine to stand here. I mean, this part is easy. I laugh at when Rabbi tells the story of people thinking that his only job is you know, 70 minutes on the Shabbat. They don't see the numbers of hours that that man spends when he should be sleeping, when I should be sleeping. And I say, Rabbi, look. <laughs> I remember telling him in the beginning, I was like, look, Rabbi, I'm going to turn my phone off at 10 p.m. You can do whatever you want before 10. It's, it's amazing because he'll call at 9.45, 9.15. He said, it's not 10 yet. <laughs> I love it. But this is what we're called to do. And so I'm not complaining because I believe I'm called to do it, but those that, that want to be in a position of authority but don't know what it is to serve don't, don't understand that that means you're going to be the first. Usually they come in, you're going to be the last. When we went out to the picnic, again, not pat myself on the back, but me and Steve got there. The first picnic, when we were starting at like 12, we got there at 6 in the morning. Craig was there. Craig was there before I got there. Um, and it was Craig and me and Steve Waffle. <laughs> And we were there at 6 in the morning, and the rest of the congregation for the picnic didn't show up till 12 o'clock. That's why we moved it up a few hours for Shavuot, because I said it's inconsiderate to have it that late, you know? And you have people sitting there waiting, holding tables. It's inconsiderate for those people and their families, so we should move it up, and we did. Um, and it was great. But, yeah, before you raise your hand and run up, I want to do this, I want to do that, where are you serving? Because you don't have to ask to do that. I ask a lot. And I'm very grateful since Rabbi has smacked us around a little bit. A lot of people, I haven't really had to ask. We had more than enough to do what we need to do here, and I'm very grateful for that. So good point. Sorry for, to ramble on about it. Good point, Craig. All right, Janet. Thank you, Billy. You're welcome. Yeah, I love this Parsha. It's really so much, right, that we can get from it. So even for the first uh, verse on 13, when it says, send men to spite out the land, I was thinking that perhaps, perhaps here yeah, I was was testing them, right? Testing these leaders to to see the report, to see what because he knew he was going to give them the land. He didn't have to see what was going on, but he did it for. He allowed them the opportunity to to try that and and see what how they would come out if they were going to be trust trusting in him or not. And when it says uh, that on verse twenty eight, when um, it says. Um, but the people who dwell in the land are strong, and the cities are walled, very great, right? Uh, but before that, it, he says that they actually did say that we went to the land where you sent us, and truly it flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. So I was thinking about how, um, if we can compare this to the Torah, right? So Torah tells us that there is a blessing when we obey, but we need to do our, our part, so they had to go and conquer the land and receive the blessing, right? The, the honey, the milk, the, the beautiful land. And, but they got discouraged, right? It says, but, it says, but the people who dwell in the land are strong, you know, and the cities are walled. So uh, it made me think of so many times do we also get discouraged in our walk, but also we, we may even come up with excuses on why we, sh we cannot do that. You know, we enter with our own reasoning following our own words, our own minds, our own thoughts, instead of listening to him through rabbi, right? And so that, that, was, that was what I got from it. And um, also with Caleb, you know, when he says he silenced the people <clears throat> because they were giving an evil report, uh, he, had, he had to be so, not only having so much emunah and trust, but also he had to be so courageous to be the only one standing up, really against everybody else, because he knew that, he, that Yahweh was with them, right? And what a beautiful testimony to see that, right? And how we get to see that even here with Rabbi, you know, when he stands up and he says the things that he teaches us without any fear. In YouTube, when people, a lot of people are, gonna, are listening to that, and he's the one standing up for us, and that's really amazing. So that's what Amen. I got from it. Amen. Amen. 
yeah, I compliment Rabbi all the time, and he's so used to doing it, and he does it with such ease how he'll get loud. He's not yelling, but he'll get loud to cut through the noise of the other person. And actually, when he starts, when he gets loud, they do be quiet. <laughs> they'll say, oh, you know, they'll be quiet, and, you know, uh, it allows whatever Yahweh has given him to come through and be able to deal with the situation. A lot of times, I know I, I had a, a particular phone call that I got, and it was two different situations. One was anxiety and some other things, and so Rabbi happened to be at my desk, and I said, I need your help with this one. One part I could handle, which was the reality part, the part about the anxiety that they were having about the reality, it was difficult to, to separate the two because they were putting them both together. Uh, Rabbi came in and, listen, <laughs> stop. Listen to what I'm saying. And he got through and, and was able to uh, break the two apart, and it was amazing to see. Um, and I shared many times to see Rabbi in that anointed appointed role when it, it's almost like I can tell when he moves out of the way and allows uh, Abba to start using him because it's a different, when you talked about Caleb, that different spirit, it's a different spirit. And uh, without getting all weirded out uh, in Christianese terms, it's, it's definitely a different spirit when he's operating in that flow uh, and things begin to flow differently and people begin to get healed and situations taken care of. So that's awesome. Rabbi definitely does that. Yes, Michael. This is probably a different way to say what Janet just said, but when I read uh, chapter 13 here and I see that they bring back this gigantic cluster of grapes and these pomegranates and these figs, I think to myself, this is Yahweh showing you what's there. It's no different from reading Revelation 21 and Revelation 22 to give you a glimpse of what's on the other side of the door, of the millennium and the kingdom teaching. You walk the path, you get to the door, you wait, and then when it's open to you, you can go in. But this fear that they have of going up there because of the walled cities and the Nephilim and you know all, all these things they're terrified of, this is our fear. And maybe not us, I'm using that ambiguously, but our fear is we walk through our daily lives of getting fired when we tell our boss we won't work Shabbat. This is our fear of our family members rebuking us when we tell them we're not going to keep Christmas or Easter anymore. These are the things we're afraid of. These are our Nephilim. Amen. Very good. Amen. Once again, as Brianna said so brilliantly, it's we don't trust them. Well, we trust them enough. I think from what I've seen, even in my own life, I used to trust him enough to get what I want. Trust him enough to get the results that I, that I want, that I'm seeking. And then when I get what I want, then all of a sudden my, my faith is wavering because I'm not trusting. And I was so glad when we came into this walk, one of Rabbi's first teachings, well, not the first, the first was beware of false prophets. So uh, we stuck around after that. But it was talking about uh, developing Yamina. And what does, what does that mean to put all of your faith in trust? I thought, and I still do, and, I, and we teach and, 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 and help people to understand that you need to do everything you know to do, and then he'll do what he needs to do. But he's not going to do what you're not going to do. If you're not going to do it and it's within your means to do it, he's not going to do that. You have to do it. You have to trust him enough to believe if you do it, he will do what he said he would do. But we get so caught up in ourselves or get caught up in whatever we get caught up in, usually our self-sovereignty, that we don't want to trust. We don't want to let go. And the only relevance and excuses that we have is really attached to people. It's not really attached to him. We don't trust him because of this person or that person or this situation or that situation. we got to learn to trust him in all situations. Lean not to our own understanding and all always acknowledge him, and he will direct our path. So we got to trust him. So great. Um, talking about flowing with milk and honey, uh, one thing I wrote in my notes is that the milk and honey represents abundance. And a lot of people that I talk to are afraid when I talk about wealth or finances, they're afraid of abundance because they're afraid of success. They're afraid of having too much because they don't know what to do with the little they had. So that lets me know where their amunai is. 
It's wavering. They need to build their faith. If he's entrusting you with more, if he's entrusting you with abundance, if he's bringing you into a place of abundance, then he's prepared you before you got there or you wouldn't have it. Or, as the whole story tells us, it's a test. He's testing you to see what you're going to do. I'm going to bring you into this place of abundance. What are you going to do? Are you going to keep it to yourself? Are you going to share with others? Are you going to help somebody else to get to where you are? Or you just want to sit back and showboat and say, nan, nan, boo, boo, I got this. And you can get it too. But you're not showing anybody. I got a rich uncle. He's not on my side of family, so that won't mess up who he is. <laughs> I got a rich uncle, and I, I met him a few years back uh, before we moved here from Connecticut. And I sat down with him, and he retired at 41 in 1991. At the age of 41, he retired a millionaire. And I asked him, well, what did you do to do that? And he said, you know what, Billy? I'm let me tell you something. Nobody has ever asked me that. Everybody that knows, you know, his, he's a millionaire. He doesn't act like one, doesn't look like one. He said, nobody's ever asked me that. He said, everybody always asks me for money. They never ask me for how I got it. He said, his kids, they're mad, broke. Well, they're not really broke, but they're not millionaires, but they're mad. He said, his own kids never asked him how he did it. They just, daddy, give me. Can I have? Family members, can I have? Can I have? But they're not willing to go through what you, what you went through to get what you have, but they want to sit back and complain or beg or ask or make fun of you or tease you because you got something they don't have and make you the meanest person in the world. I don't have it, so you shouldn't have it either. Did you go through what I got, went through to get what I have? Are you willing to stand against the Nephilim, stand against the giants to get the abundance? Or do you want to come back and wimp and cry because the giants were too big? I'm just saying, I'm, I'm just not built like that. If there's no door, I make one because my daddy is bigger <laughs> than the whole world. And if he say go, I go. If he say do, I do. And so uh, we just, again, going back to Brianna, trust. It's the whole thing. We got to trust him. We gotta trust him in everything. Especially when we don't understand, when we don't hear him, when we don't see him, when we don't when we don't understand, we gotta trust him. I think I demonstrated that and I testified about it not too uh not uh, a few weeks back when I asked Rabbi about trusting him when I don't understand him. I have to trust him. No two ways about it. And this job <laughs> and this walk. I have to trust him. All the lives that he touched around the world, I have to trust that man. I have to trust him as Abba has placed him in this structure for me to trust. So between me and Yeshua, I have to trust Rabbi with everything. And I believe that he placed Rabbi in my life for me to give me, to give me an example, a physical person that I can practice that relationship with. And I was sharing with Robertson today, I've never had that relationship or the opportunity with any leader I ever served because those leaders wanted to prostitute me for my gifts. They didn't want to see me grow to be what I wanted me to be. They want to prostitute me for the gifts that I had. And I remember asking Rabbi in one of the first conversations we had face to face, I said, so you don't mind if I do this? I don't even remember what it was. Something entrepreneurial. You don't mind if I do this or that? He was like, no. I don't mind if you do that. As a matter of fact, he said, if you, you need help, I'll help you do it. I don't, I, that's not, it doesn't intimidate me. I'm not afraid of that. I'm not afraid of you. Whatever you do, I'm not, I'm not afraid. I said, really? I said, no, I'm not worried about that. So, <laughs> he's so humble. <laughs> so, matter of fact, no, I'm not worried. So confident, right? And you have to be in this job. You have to be. All right, I didn't talk. Y'all didn't got me talking. Sorry, Rabbi. It's Gary's fault. Live stream. You got 13? You got me looking at the clock. We're going to be 10 30 again. I thought we were going to get out of here. No, I'm kidding. We're going we gonna to get out fast. Steve left, so we're going to get out. <laughs> Beyond Ready 7. In Numbers 13, 1, why did Yah command spies to be sent out since he had already promised them the land? Was it a test? 
Absolutely. The whole book is a test. Your life is a test. Everything you're going through from the time you were born until the time you stand before him is all a test. Either it's a test to see how you're going to play out, and maybe even the test of the leaders, as, as Craig pointed out. Everybody was being tested. Moses was being tested. Moshe was being tested. The people were being tested. Yes, it was a test. Michelle Perez uh, comment in uh, 1330. We are supposed to embrace the above and bring it into the below too. Caleb and Yehoshua chose to embrace the intrinsic nature of Yahweh and they saw the land the way Yahweh told them. Amen. Absolutely. Next. Ben White, prior to verse 31 in verse 28 through 29, they bought into the information about the lands and start to panic. In chapter 13, verse 31 through 33, could we see this as a lack of faith due to this and connect this to Deuteronomy 20? Definitely a lack of faith, as they didn't trust what he said. He's comparing it to Deuteronomy 20. It says, when you go out to battle against your enemies and shall see horses and chariots and peoples more numerous than you, do not be afraid of them, for Yahweh, your Elohim, who brought you out from the land of Mitzrayim, is with you. Absolutely. Saying the exact same thing. Are you going to trust them? Which goes back again to, I'm not going to say her name, the very first point of the evening, which I said we could close after that, because everything everybody could say is going to be involved, wrapped up in this portion about trusting him and trusting leadership, and trusting the leaders that most of us ask for, then we get them, and then we don't want them, we don't like them, because they said something that hurt our feelings, because uh, uh, apparently feelings matter uh, when Yahweh says something. Apparently he's concerned about our feelings. I don't want to tease about it, but he, he's really not concerned about your feelings. If he was concerned about your feelings, he might have let Everybody except the two that he let go in and everybody else died, not die in the desert because he was concerned about your whining, complaining, and your whimpering, and your murmuring, and all the rest of the feelings associated with his instruction. So you either do it because he says do it, and I know nobody asked this question. You do, <laughs> you do it because he told you to do it, or you do it because he makes you do it. But either way, you're going to do it, so you might as well just do it the first time, Jonah. Next. <laughs> Michelle Perez, comment on 1330. We are supposed to embrace the above and bring it into the below too. Caleb and Yehoshua chose to embrace... Oh, I already read this. I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, you read that one. Um, oh. She probably wrote it again. I'm teasing Michelle. I'm no. teasing. Randall McFarland, question, chapter 30... Oh, sorry. Chapter 13, verse 32. What does this part of that verse mean? is a land that eats up the inhabitants thereof. He was saying that the, the people of the land, the, the inhabitants of the land were great. They were giants. So if you are a grasshopper going into a giant, and if I'm incorrect, Rabbi will correct me and send a text message. But the, the land was filled with giants, and they were afraid, and it was supposed to be frightening to them if they didn't trust him. It was a test of their faith. So the land was big, and it looked like grasshoppers would go in and get squashed because they thought themselves to be so small, so much smaller than the giants that were there. And it even says after that, uh, and all the people who saw it, uh, who saw in it are men of great size. So it's talking about they look small in the eyes of the giants that were there. So. that all for 13? No. no. Um, Michelle Perez, a comment in 1333. The lesson I learned from this is that people view us as we view ourselves. If we lack confidence, people will treat us that way. Yahweh called us to be something more than what we can see. Amen. Very good comment. And that's Amen. it for 13. That's it for 13. All right. You guys want to start live stream with 14 and then we'll go to the audience.
uh, back to our roots, uh, 14.4, why would anyone want to go back to Mitzrayim? Because they were afraid. And they liked leeks and garlic and, and beaten and, you know, and not being able to honor Shabbat. So the day of, they didn't get any rest. They liked that. So that was much better than trusting Yahweh to provide all that they needed. Donna Stevens, 14.9, why does it, I'm sorry, what does it mean by do not rebel against Yah or fear the people of the land for they are our bread? He gave you land. He gave you abundance. And you feared the people that were already there that he told you to go and take what he gave you. And so you didn't get it. You didn't trust him enough to get your blessing. So it's what I was saying earlier. You didn't get your blessing because you were afraid. You, were big, you rebelled against what, what Yahweh said. He said to go in and take it. The test was sending the spies, but he already told you it was yours. But you rebelled against what he said, and so you had to suffer the consequences. Don't we all suffer the consequences when we rebel against his word and don't follow his instruction? We suffer the consequences. Theirs were 40 years. Next. Back to our roots, 1442. Can you explain this verse, and how can I love or have compassion to my enemies like Yahweh does? Because he knows I have some strong ones. I don't, uh, say it again. I'm trying to see how that relates to 42. 1442. Read the question again. Can you explain this verse and how I can love or have compassion to my enemies like Yahweh does? Well, the, the verse says contrary. Actually, they were smitten by the enemies. So Yahweh told them don't do. They did. Then they tried to correct what they messed up and did which he said not to do, and they were smitten. So the Israelites were smitten because they did what Yahweh told them not to do. So I'm not sure how that relates to your enemies. They got a spanking by Yahweh, basically, because they were disobedient. Then they, co they tried to correct their disobedience, and he said, don't do it, and then they got in trouble. Perfect example. So somebody... Somebody trying to say it without saying it. So somebody posted something on Facebook, right? And Rabbi says if you post something in public, he's going to correct it in public. So they made a public post. So we corrected the public post and spoke to them about the public post about not making it public to come and talk to us in person not to make it public, because you didn't give us an opportunity to deal with whatever your concern was. The person understood. The person left and posted their apology on Facebook. I didn't get it. I called them back. So literally what we asked you not to do, you call yourself apologizing and doing what we asked you not to do, and that was supposed to fix it. You did the same thing twice. That's what they did. Yahweh said do, they didn't do. Yahweh punished them, they decided that they were gonna now go and do it after they got corrected, which he told them not to do, and they did and got killed. So, do it the first time he told you to do it. If he said don't do it, then don't do it. So hopefully that helps uh, back to our roots. Ben White, for clarification in chapter 14, verse 43, is the sword here Torah his word? The sword, the sword here literally is the sword. 
I'm not sure Rabbi can correct if it's if it could be used as a metaphor for the word, but the sword here is the sword because the uh, Amalekites and the Canaanites are there before you and you shall fall by the sword because you have turned away from Yahweh. Yahweh is not with you. So that's connecting what I just said about them doing something he said not to do. Then they went to go do it, trying to correct what he told them to do the first time they didn't want to do, and they fell by the sword. And he's saying, I'm not with you. You didn't do what I told you to do. I'm not with you. So it's like you tell your kid, don't touch the stove. The stove is hot. They touched the stove. They found out the stove was hot. Got burnt. And now they want to come back and cry to you, and you told them beforehand not to touch it. And they knew it was hot. I mean, so the sword here, to answer your question, Ben, is literally the sword. They fell, and Yahweh was not with them because they did not listen. Hard-headed, stiff-necked. Next. Absolutely. Uh, so Rabbi Steve made a comment about um, the question where they said they are our bread. It was in 14.9, uh, and he said, this is saying that they would be sustained by the bread of their enemies. Amen. Great. And Thank other you, than Rabbi. I'm oh, sorry. Other than that, that was it. Awesome. 14. Thank you. I appreciate that, Rabbi. It's got back up. <laughs> All right, what else you have? That was it for 14. All right, 14 out here. All right. Whoever gets there first. Well, everybody getting up for 14. That must have been a good one. Oh, what? All right, so for me, um, the main theme that really stuck out, was, trust is a big thing, but to me the core issue is misplaced fear. Um, this really made me think a lot about uh, Rabbi's series, The Fear of Yahweh, basically where he says, if you have a, pr a, a proper fear and reverence of Yahweh, you'll never fear anything else ever again. And it goes back to fearing everything but him and the consequences of not obeying his Torah. And a few key verses, uh, the first one is uh, verse 6 that really stuck out to me. And Yehoshua, son of Nun, and Kalev, son of Yefuna who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their garments after the false report. And what was interesting to me is they spoke to the congregation and they said, this land is amazing. If Yahweh is for us, who can be against us? And don't rebel against Yahweh. And Yahweh allowed that right up until they decided, hey, we're going to stone them to death. Then he interceded. He let them speak on his behalf and speak truth to them before he interceded. And then it goes on to say... Um, Let's see. To verse 36 and 37, the men whom Moshe sent to spy out the land who returned and made all the congregation grumble against him by bringing an evil report of the land, even those men who brought the evil report about the land died by the plague before Yahweh. These 10 men who slandered Yahweh died a violent death. Okay, they didn't just die in their sleep. They died a very violent, nasty, horrific death. And what that, thinking about that over the last, you know, half an hour or so, it made me think about the message of your teaching, how Yahweh wants to establish his covenant with us. He says, I'm, I want to give you abundance. I want to give you wealth. I want to give you these things. But you need to fear and trust and do. So if we aren't fearing, trusting, and doing, how are we any different than those ten men who slandered Yahweh. We deserve to die that same death. And that's what I got from it. Wow. <laughs> wow. Great. That was a great comment. Fear, trust, do. Is that a t-shirt somewhere? Fear, trust, do. <laughs> Mercy. Robinson said, I'm going to rap. <laughs> Well, let her rip now. <laughs> Word to your mother. Um, no, I'm paying homage to Brooklyn since Rabbi's in New York and New York. You know, I'm from New York. You know, I'm trying to pay homage. This is a 
Yankees cap, you know, but it's not, it's in T-O-Y. Um, <laughs> okay, so chapter 14, a couple of things. One, it just reiterates that delayed obedience is nothing but disobedience. Uh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Robinson. Um, <laughs> The, the second thing I thought of was um, when it talks about how, you know, the father is um, compassionate and he's patient and he's willing to forgive. And it's interesting because in Christianity, um, we're sort of kind of taught that, yes, he does forgive but we're never taught that there are consequences if you disobey. So, and I know plenty of people who say, no, 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 he forgives you and you know, that's it and it's, it's all wiped away and it's like, no, that's not what the word says. That's not what Torah says. Torah, whether it's in the Tanakh or the Brick Hadashah, it does not say that. You are still going to deal with the consequences of whatever you did. Now, the father is the father. He can do all of that. He can, you know, wipe it away if he wants to, but it wouldn't benefit you if he did. But he also knows what you're able to handle and not handle, so he's going to deal with it appropriately because he's just. Um, it doesn't mean that he's not just if we still have to deal with consequences. Somebody can be forgiven for whatever crime they, they committed, but they still may have to serve time, which is, it's part of it. And if we know that on an, an eight on an innate level, on a human level, if he is far above our thoughts and our ways, why would we think that he doesn't stand for justice as well in any situation? So that was another thing I thought about. And I know the person who made the comment about why would you go back to Mitzrayim, and I know we've been talking about trust and all that other stuff, um, which is great. I know for me personally, before I learned how to trust Yah. It was easier for me to do it on my own. It was harder to trust because you're trying to trust someone, something that you can't tangibly see. So I can see my own strength. I can see what I've done. I can see how I can attain whatever it is that I need to attain. But I... I'll back up. When the father told me to walk away from my career, I was like, what? It wasn't a job, it was a career that I spent years wanting to do and I finally was there, finally arrived. And when he told me to walk away, I did it out of obedience. I didn't understand, well, no, I did understand it. I did it out of obedience, but I remember I went into, I'm not the type of person that gets depressed, but I went into a depression. And I remember I felt the father ask, you know, not ask me, but saying, you know, why don't you talk? And I felt like he said, well, now that we got that out of the way. Because I needed to see that I didn't trust him. And when I started on that journey, and when he took me on that journey, it was, wow, this is not as easy. <laughs> As everyone makes it seem, at least in Christianity, you know, this faith thing is not as easy, you know, because faith in Christianity is different from faith that is in Torah. And it was just, I don't know, it was, it was liberating when I finally was able to pass some trust tests. <laughs> Uh, and I'm not going to say that I'm 100% because I don't want another test for him to say, we'll prove it now. So I'm not going to say that. But he knows where I am. <laughs> you know, right? Right. Too late now. Here it come. Here it come. Um, but, you know, I think chapter 14 and, and just, just even go through the Torah portions, it's really, and like Brianna stated earlier, it's all about trust. And we just need to learn how to do that. And... It's hard to articulate how to do that to someone when they say, well, how do you trust him? And it's like, I don't know how to tell you to do that, but I know that he will give you a measure of it 
for you to just walk and continue to walk and he's got you. I don't know how that's possible and it doesn't make any sense to the intellectual mind, but he does. But then, you know, he confounds the wise. You know, so I just wanted to say that because those are some of the things that I thought about. Amen. Word Amen. to your mother. <laughs> <laughs> this is, thank you. This is my first time doing tour study and I'm, I'm enjoying it. Uh, as Mercy was talking, uh, some things I believe Abba uh, uh, gave me while she was talking. And it's really my experience. Uh, in this walk, and it is do. Do, then trust. My trust in this walk didn't come until after I did it. So I did, I trusted, because I love him. And what is love to him? Obedience. So I did it. I already had a re some sort of a relationship that I trusted him. So I did it because I trusted him, which allowed me to trust him even more, to, to know that this next journey or this journey that I'm on, that I could trust him and I was able to do and trust because I loved him, that means I was gonna be obedient even when I don't understand. And I think that's one of the reasons I've been able to be safe uh, in my relationship in the vertical structure is because I'm trusting the person that he's put. I didn't, Rabbi didn't ask any of us to come and follow him. We found him, however we found him, and we vetted him, and we trust him, and we're following in the vertical structure and submitting to that authority, and because of that, we've been blessed. As Mercy said, whether we wrong or not, wrong or right. We've been blessed because, as Rabbi often says, in his position, he has to be right. Not because he's callous or arrogant or whatever the case may be, he has to be right because he, do, he bears a double judgment if he's wrong, which is another word to all those that want to jump up behind the mic. You don't want that responsibility. I don't want that responsibility. I'm so grateful to have somebody above me <laughs> that I can bounce, that can correct me, and that I can uh, submit to. So do it. And I, I tell this to people all the time. I just never realized it in the way that he gave me the understanding now, but to do it. And through doing it, you'll learn how to trust him. And then that trusting, if you love him and you're obedient to doing it and trusting him, then you'll come into that place of abundance. Whether it be a physical abundance, whether it be a spiritual abundance, whether it be a health abundance, but that, that place of abundance in whatever area of life that he deems necessary. So thank you, Mercy, for pointing that out. A lot of times we got it wrong. We want to trust. And I know from Christianity that I was born and raised on a pew, uh, we have this idea that we have to trust and we have to understand before we can do. No, absolutely not. I feel like that conversation, well, it always reminds me of that conversation. I don't feel like it. It reminds me of that conversation he had with Job. Like, how dare, I, I don't, uh, maybe somebody else thinks they, they do, but I don't think I'm, I'm even worthy to question Abba. I, I, I'm barely getting to the point where I can ask him for something for myself. I can ask for everybody else, but asking for my own self, I feel so unworthy. Uh, and I'm grateful for what he's done, but I know me, and I know the crap that I've done and things that I've experienced. And so for me to, oh, I ain't going to get into it. Okay, Grace, it's your turn. Be standing here, and <laughs> tears flowing. <laughs> um. <laughs> So one of my biggest takeaways from chapter 14 was that all 12 of the people who went out and they were scouting the land, they were all seeing the same things, but the difference was where their focus was. For Caleb and Joshua, their focus was on the promise that he gave them, but then for everybody else, and then what turned out to be the rest of everybody of Israel, is that they allowed their trials that they saw before them to take on their primary focus. So even though they had trusted and they had followed leading after the smoke throughout all of the time in the desert, once it came down to the point where they were facing the trials that they thought that they couldn't handle, they lost their focus and they lost their focus off of the promise. And then when they acted upon that, 
they didn't make it into the kingdom. But then we have Caleb and Yehoshua as examples that even if we face trials that we don't think we can overcome as long as our focus is on the promise and then we act according to that focus on that promise that we can make it into the land. Amen. Amen. I like that. I like that, Grayson. Great. She's back. All right, Brianna. All right, so reading 14.4, and they said to each other, let us appoint a leader and let us turn back to Mitzrayim. Um, everyone was focus, focusing on the second half of the verse of Mitzrayim, but I looked at um, the appointing a leader, and it made me think of Romans 13. Um, I bookmarked it, but <laughs> hold on. That's not it. There we go. Um, uh, let every being be in subjection to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from Elohim, and the authorities that exist are appointed by Elohim. So he who presses the authority withstands the institution of Elohim, and those who withstand shall bring judgment on themselves. Um, so it's basically just like he gets to appoint who gets to appoint. You don't get to pick and choose just because something they did it just reminded me of that so oh man that's really good it reminded me you reading that reminded me of what uh, brian shared about the leaders so the leaders died of, of plagues it said as brian put a horrible death uh the children of israel died in the desert i mean they never made it in but they it doesn't say that they died like a horrendous death they just died off old age or whatever but the leaders you see there that that judgment on the leadership, you know, um, as Rabbi said, you know, which, which cloud are you following, you know? Um, the three people understood that. Uh, and I didn't mean it in that way. I'm just saying, you know, we, we follow people. Uh, we follow ministries. We follow leadership, and we don't vet it out. And I, one thing that I give Rabbi tons of credit for, I give him credit for a lot of things. One thing I really give him credit for in his appointed, anointed and appointed role is that he doesn't say, come follow him. He doesn't say, come follow him. He don't say, give me your money. He don't say, put all your money here. He don't have a love offering. He doesn't go around 12 times. We don't lock the doors. He doesn't do all that. He said, fine, you find the anointed appointed one. If I'm that one, that's fine, but you find that person. That's on you to find. So if you find him and you submit and then you have a problem, then you probably should come to the person that you have the problem with, the one you submitted to. I know we had a, a situation, and I saw him first time I've been here face to face, and I saw him when we got the news that someone uh, had left the congregation, and I was there with him face to face. We heard at the same time, and I'm looking at him because I've never had that happen before when I'm with him. Uh, and I look at him, <laughs> and uh, I laugh like I just did. Uh, you know, I thought initially, you know, uh, that's a sad thing and it is sad when someone leaves not sad like i'm you know sad everybody has their journey to go on and rabbi says that all the time so i'm looking at his face and it, his face didn't he didn't change his attitude didn't change As a matter of fact the conversation we had stopped while we heard the news and then it started right where we left off and i asked him i said doesn't move you he said no you know i feel you know people have to make their own decisions they have to make their own choices. I'm not here to hold them captive. I'm, I'm not, you know, the prison guard or war. They don't belong to me. They belong to him. So if they go, then Abba has a reason for them going. If they came, Abba has a reason for them coming. So it's awesome to have leadership that way that is not concerned about, oh, they my member. This is my member. This is my, it's mine. It's mine. It's, it's, he gave it. No, it's his. He just gave us a rabbi that has that he gave authority over what's his. He gave it authority, rabbi authority over it. And so rabbi understands it as his, and if it goes, <laughs> he understands it. It doesn't move him one way or the other. Obviously, we would all, I, I don't want to say obviously we all want him to stay because I don't know, you know, want everybody to stay and then to grow and get big, but uh, Abba has his plans for everybody, you know, and he prunes and does what he has to do in the body, and that's what he needs to do. So I saw that face-to-face -face, uh, with Rabbi, and I was like, you know, 
he says it and he means what he says and he, he does what he says and he means what he says. If, did I say it already, Ben? <laughs> yeah, yeah, all that. <laughs> and so he doesn't sugarcoat it behind closed doors or out here on the mic. And I appreciate that uh, because he is the real deal. All right, Michael. It's Brianna's fault, sorry. In 14, verse 43, the last sentence is, because you have turned away from Yahweh, Yahweh is not with you. Mm. And to me, it seems this kind of logically flows, but I wanted to bring this up for anybody who's watching and they're kind of teetering on the fence of, am I going to tell my boss I can't work Shabbat? Am I going to tell my family member that I'm not keeping these other holidays anymore? But because you have turned away from Yahweh, Yahweh is not with you. If somebody comes in that door right now, they're with us by default, and we are with them by default. If they leave, we are no longer with them. Amen. Good point. Good point. That's a reality check. Amen. You don't have anything, Jen? Yes, I do. Oh, you're waiting for last. Oh, look, you're so wonderful. That is, look at her. <laughs> So in 14, we see um, that this likely isn't just um, the 12 leaders, that these were leaders of the leaders that um, we don't hear anything that the, the 70 leaders that had Moshe's anointing a couple chapters ago, they weren't tearing their clothes. Um, it was four of them with our leadership um, other than Moshe, it was three. Um, you know, we, we speak about people leaving. Um, any one of us would be awfully prideful and arrogant to see ourselves in that spot and not in the spot of everybody else. And it was four people. I mean, I just don't see my, I mean, how do we have that, I mean, that arrogance to see ourselves in this story? It was all of this went through, and it's all for our benefit. Like these, they died a horrible death for us to read this. I don't think they, that we should read it and, oh, we wouldn't do that. There's a, 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 an aura of hive mentality, um, some sort of collective consciousness within this group of people that I think is uh, kind of follows maybe his people around that it's different than, than what I want or what any individual wants and it's just easy to, to read it and to be arrogant to think that we'd be one of that four. You know, I've seen multiple people that had your position come through and leave. You know, real, you know, talk about leaving. It's, you know, multiple people watching last year's Torah portions. I mean, the person with the microphone, I mean, he's not here. And he's not here in not good ways. You know, it, it really, this is such a difficult thing that we're all trying to do here. Amen. I, mean, I would just say, you said so much. Uh, I would just say that I think the purpose and the point of this whole book is for exactly what you said, for us to not think of ourselves more highly than we should, as Rabbi said. But this book has given us the instruction because we need it to see that, as you said, so we cannot, so we can make it. I mean, how many of us, as you said, even last year, were, were looking at it and not where we are today? That so just goes to show you that even almost 6,000 years and counting, we're still trying to get it right. How many in this room won't make it in? I mean, I talked about it about the good fruit. They, these were people that were covenanted and they didn't get in. They weren't prepared. And they, they saw, I mean, we, we read, right? We read and we see it happening, as you said, right in our own congregation. And, and some of us still haven't awakened to the fact that it could be me. I mean, I stand up here, we all stand up here and watch <laughs> Rabbi 
try to, with words, smack people upside the head to get them to wake up to see they're in their ways and they're toward pursuing as we all are. And some people still don't get it. He can look them right in the face and he could be talking to them <laughs> and they still don't get it. It's like, oh my gosh, are these people not listening? So yeah, absolutely. It could be somebody sitting beside you. You know, it could be you, it could be me. But Yahweh know that we could make it from where he called us and where we are. So we got to keep doing what we know to do and keep being prepared so when he shows up, when a master comes and takes account for what he's given us, we want to hear him say, well done. Because I'm not going to be looking at who's to the left or the right. I'm trying to work out my own soul salvation, fear and trembling, and fear of him because I love him and I want to be obedient. So I mean, good job, uh, Craig. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Janet. Yeah. Um, yes, this uh, verse 17, I'm sorry, 18 really spoke to me when it says, Yahweh is patient and of great loving commitment, forgiving crookedness and transgression, but by no means living unpunished by visiting the crookedness of the fathers and the children to the third and fourth generations, which really speaks to me about it, you know, his character and integrity. But, you know, how much I forget that this is a big part where I need to grow in that character and integrity, right? But like, he's, he is patient. I'm supposed to also be patient and great uh, in loving commitment, right? And endurance until the end. I, I need to meditate on, I've realized that I really need to meditate on this verse uh, every day so that I can really, I can really understand how holy he is, right? And how far I am from that and how I need to really start working towards that uh, to really make it, right? Because one of the things that I love when he says here that if Yahweh, in verse 8, he says, if Yahweh has delighted in us, then he shall bring us into this land and give it to us. And I want so much for him to delight in me, but I really need to be real. Like Rabbi says, you know, game is over. You know, you really need to be real with where you are. I need to be real with where I am. I compare myself to him and what he says in his character, which is patient and great love and commitment. So I really, I really like that. And I also love the, the way um, Moshe, we see how many times he really is interceding for the people of Israel. He comes before Yahweh and he says, you know, you are love, patience and loving commitment. Please forgive the crookedness of these people. And it's not the first time that we see that account <clears throat> and how forgiving he is. But then he says, yes, I shall forgive. But truly, as I live and all the earth is filled with the steam of Yahweh, these men are not going to see the land, right? So it's kind of like what Mar Marcy was saying, you know, there's, there's consequences uh, to our actions. And yes, he is forgiven, but we need to take this walk very seriously because our actions are going to determine where we end up, right? Yeah. So that's all I have. Amen. Amen. So verse 8, you mentioned, uh, if, you, if Yahweh has delighted in us, and he shall bring us into the land and give it to us, and the land which is flowing with milk and honey. It reminded me of in Psalms, the scripture that says, if we delight ourselves in Yahweh, he'll give us the desires of our heart. So I saw that as going both ways. But it's all about us delighting, delighting in what he has prepared for us, what he wants to give us, the abundance. And if we get excited and delight ourselves in him and who he is, if, if we're doing and trusting and loving, then he'll give us this, these things. I used to think, as Mercy said a little bit about it, I used to think that it was kind of like a passive aggressive thing with me and my relationship with him because I wanted to do everything and only asked him for what I needed because I looked at it as any responsible person would. I don't need it, so I'll do everything I need to do, and then if I, if I need you or when I need you because we need him at some point, then we would ask him for it. I wasn't including him in it, giving everything to him because I thought that was me giving up my responsibility to do what I needed to do because the church confused me in thinking <laughs> that all I have to do is believe. I knew I had to work even when I was in the church. I knew it was something I needed to do. I just didn't know how that fit in because they said we didn't have to do it. It wasn't for you. It was done away with. So how do I do 
what the word is telling me to do. And now I know that I simply do it by doing it. And trusting if I do it that I'll get the desired end that he has for me. Because I'm happy when I do it. I'm delighting myself in him each and every day. Because I don't know how he's going to do it. I don't know how he can take something like this and use it for his glory. I'm not perfect. Don't try to be. I try to be the best that I can be, and I try to be, you know, humble, but I know I was a, a mess. But he loved me enough that he chose me to do, to trust, and to love. So delighting in him, he delights in us, and we delight in him, and he loves us first. He loved us first, and we love him back in obedience to what he called us to do. So I think that was great. Thank you so much. All right, anybody else for 14? If not, we're going to go to 15, and we're going to start with live stream for 15. Nothing for 15? Oh, mercy. Don't look at mercy. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Back to our roots, 15, verse 35 and 36. I'm curious, are we lucky or cursed that we are no longer stoned for breaking Abba's Torah? Well, since I know who Back to Our Roots are, and I know that she has three wonderful children, I I would consider it a blessing, and I'm sure all of us, going back to what Craig said, are truly blessed to be able to be sitting here and even reading his word, because none of us deserve to even utter his name out of our lips. So I would consider it a huge blessing that we're able to to be able to pursue Torah observance. So I would say a definite blessing. A great comment. That's that's all we have. What? For, I know. All right. Anybody here for 50? All right. Go ahead, Janet. You got number one. Number one in the house. Yeah, it was, um, I love when it says uh, verse 16, one Torah and one right ruling is for you and for the stranger. Mm-hmm. Because we're, I think I'm a stranger, but I join in the camp, right? And my husband is too, and I just love that my husband had um, followed that command today, and it's just a praise to Yah for that. Amen. Amen. Yes, that that really warmed my heart. And But the other one I wanted to mention was that it was 39, you know, after after they found that man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day and they stoned him, then he gave them the commandment to wear the seat to remember. And he, dis- he does mention remember two times, I think. Remember all the commands and so that you remember, right? So um, I really like what it says in here, that you remember and shall do them, shall do the commands and not search after your own heart and your own eyes after which you were whoring, which is what R- Rabbi always teaches us, right? That teaches that we are... Um, not to trust our hearts because our hearts are deceiving, right? And not go by our emotions, but really what is what is written and by the teachings, and not trust in our own eyes because that's uh, we're depending on us, not depending on Him, right? And the Torah. So I, I don't know. I just connected that piece with with, with what Rabbi says. I mean. So notes I wrote down about that one, uh, 1538. Uh, it's for CC, it's to remind us of what we should and shouldn't do. So that was a, a strong word to, as you said, not to go by your own self sovereignty and do whatever you, you want to do, follow your own eyes or your own desires. But the CC is to remember us, for us to remember to do and what not to do. Craig? Yes, I got something with the ZZ2 that I just kind of uh, saw, and I think it not relates to last week's Torah portion, but I think there was something in last week's Torah portion. Two of the people had just gotten um, uh, the law of somebody's sins by mistake, and then whatever, um, if a being does whatever defiantly and reveals, because he despised, and it says, well, while the children were in the wilderness, they found the man gathering sticks on the Sabbath day. So they had just been given the instruction on what to do so that 
that the children probably would have heard, or they were men, probably would have heard, um, would have known the command, um, something serious, but they brought the concern to Moshe and to Aharon. And Moshe and Aharon did with it what they were supposed to and brought it to Elohim. And we have Zitzit um, following that. Last week's Torah portion it was something similar, and we gained the second Pesach which is also, um, I think, the one feast that's not technically a feast of Yah. It's actually a, a man feast, like a feast for us. And it could be, I think, similar to we follow that structure and we, we gain pretty amazing things from it. I mean, good points, good points. I meant to ask ladies, did, did Rabbi have any more comments as we were going through? No. Uh, no, not really pertaining to the reading or the questions. Okay. Michael. I just noticed this, that um, 15 verse 16, uh, one Torah and one right ruling for you and for the sojourner who sojourns with you. And then again in 29, for him who does whatever by mistake, there is one Torah, both for him who is native among the children of Israel and for the sojourner who sojourns in their midst. So that apparently needs to be reiterated time and time again. Um, and as far as uh, the, the um, making the sin offerings for the mistakes that we've committed, um, it's, it's kind of like, like a child. You know, your child does something, they don't mean to do it, but they've done something wrong. And, and they're terribly sorry for it, and they beg you for forgiveness. You forgive them. They still have to do their time. They still have to go to the corner or, or whatever their punishment is. And then finally, in verse 41, he says, I am Yahweh, your Elohim. And he says it twice. So we, need to, we need, definitely need to remember who is our master. Amen. Amen. Rabbi always tells the story about uh, during the days of unleavened bread, he had to work, and he went in talking about sin by mistake, because that's one of the questions that always pops up, like how can we sin by mistake? So he said he was at the office on unleavened bread, and he forgot about it, got caught up in work, and bit a donut, uh, and he felt horrible about it. That's a sin by mistake. Um, and yes, his, if you want to call it his his punishment, is he felt horrible about it. And he asked Abba, I'm sure to forgive him, uh, and he took better care of watching and guarding uh, the commands. Uh, that also makes talking about the seat seat. What came to me, uh, going back to that one, somebody mentioned it, I think it was maybe Craig, um, but mentioned about the seat seat um, that I hear it in, I see it in emails periodically about women wearing seat seat. And we know Rabbi says that women, it doesn't say that they have to and doesn't say that they can't. So, you know, so you can wear them if, if you're a woman, you want to wear them, you can wear them. It doesn't say either way. Uh, but here in the scripture, it says when it was commanded, it was commanded to the men to wear them. When it was established, it was established to the men to remind them. And no, yeah, <laughs> exactly. No beads and, and, and bedazzled and all that rainbows. It said a blue string, you know, CC with a blue string. So. Uh, that stuck out to me. Another one in 15. Nobody else? Okay. Another one in 15, 1535. Um, and Yahweh said to Moshe, the man shirtless shall be put to death, and all the congregation stoning him with stones outside the camp. Uh, it doesn't really go into great detail about what he did other than what he did. You know, uh, looking at some some notes uh, from pastoral studies, it, it's apparent that people were trying to speculate about what the man did or didn't do. What he didn't do was be obedient and he was stoned. So um, that was something that popped up. And make sure I covered everything in 15 and that's all I have for 15. Anybody else? Go ahead. Janet. Can you please expand a little bit more? 
when it says that they gave an evil report and how can we apply that uh, in our lives so that we learn how to do that. Thank well, you. Yes, that one's simple yet it seems to be complicated. Uh, the way that we apply it. And it's only complicated because we don't do it. And that is, it was evil because he told him to do it. He already knew what the outcome was going to be. So it was evil because he, something he intended for their good, to bless them, to give them abundance, to bring them into the land. They didn't do it. They scorned him. They pretty much disregarded what he said because they didn't trust. And so the, the, the good intention turned out to be the evil deed because they simply didn't trust him. So does that make sense? Same sounds, again, it's something very simple. But the issue is they didn't trust him. So the good became, you know, turned out to be evil for them. Yes, Miss Denise. Um, I just actually had a comment. Um, sure. In, in you, when you teach or when Rabbi teaches, were to also uh, put ourselves as there to see how it relates in our lives. And from Passover or even, pri you know, when we came prior to Passover to this point, it, it, it's, you could see steps being laid out on, on throughout it. I mean, I, I, we didn't do things exactly the way we probably should have. Um, not always trusting the process and then experiencing the sometimes correction or chastisement um, of not trusting. And then when we teshuva and get back to it, you, you, in this portion, it just, it all started to play out as from what Brianna had shared from the beginning in chapter 13 to what each person has shared. I mean, it just, it was really interesting how you could, or how I was seeing a lot of the steps being made or taken as we were coming here, and everything that, from Rabbi to Revinson to every member of the body has been really showing that good report. Um, of what Father promised, and to the point where even with what Mercy had spoke on in that trusting that you, in, unless, it's hard to, to convey it to another person, but when you experience it in, in, in with the word, it all comes to a point where you see that Father, you can trust him, it, 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 it's not, like anything you've ever known before. And it, I'm just, I'm really humbled. I feel being like I was brought to be humbled and and it's just, it's awesome. And I, I don't know if I said it correctly or not, but yeah. Yeah, I so, think you said it perfectly. I may, I may. Um, you already had your, no, I'm kidding. Um. Well, first I'll say, um, well, the mic is really loud. Okay, I'm just, I'm just a loud person. Um, so with the tzitzi, I know that there's people who have left because of like us saying like no colors or no fun beads or whatever, because you mentioned that. But it just made me think like the tzitzi was made because of what they did and they needed to remember. So it wasn't about them. It isn't about you. It's not about what you want. It's about exactly what you did wrong, so you have to do it the way he wanted it. So um, another thing is in Egypt, in, in, in slavery, they didn't really have to make many choices. They were, they were forced to do most things. But now, like with the Mishkan and everything, there was set things. He was very clear with everything, like very... Like, there's so many chapters, and you just think, oh, it's so much to read. But he was very direct. But now he's throwing out choices. The reason you exist, obviously, the teaching, right? Um, so now they're not just living as or existing. They're having to make choices and 
this is a skill that they haven't had to use very much, so it's not easy. So I'm just thinking like him leaving this like wiggle room for like choices, it really just sees like their true character, their heart. And I don't know if that made any sense, but yeah. <laughs> perfect, perfect. I mean, I liked the, the wiggle room. <laughs> I think a lot of people try to find that wiggle room because they don't want to submit. And it's not just submit. I know we should submit to the authority that Awa gives us vertical structure, but a lot of people don't want to submit to themselves. Submit to what they know is right within themselves. They want to play wiggle room in their own head, in their own body. Like, how can you just take chances? You know, I, I don't, I don't understand the, the wiggle room. It's called self sovereignty. There's plenty of wiggle room there when you do it within yourself. Rick. Okay. Wow, this was a lot. There's just one verse that really jumped out at me, and it seems to be the, the theme of the whole book. In Christianity, we were taught a song called Trust and Obey, but we didn't obey. And that goes right back to the beginning in the garden. I don't think it was about the fruit or what kind of fruit it was. They disobeyed. Um, the tree of life may have been Yeshua. Who knows? And the tree of knowledge and good and evil would have been our own wanting not to obey or distrusting or doubting. Here they doubted, but verse 35 of chapter 14, <clears throat> you know, we talked about leadership and leaders, the 10 steering them wrong and leading them to doubt. But Yahweh says here in 35, I am Yahweh, I have spoken, I shall do to this, I shall do this to all this evil congregation who are meeting against me in this wilderness. They are consumed and there they die. And then the men who spied out the land, they had their, you know, they died immediately by the plague. But the people had a part too. And I guess that goes to us vetting out leadership, picking a leader, and submitting under that leader, making sure we're in the right place under someone who's anointed and appointed, who has the authority to speak the word of Yahweh. And the other thing that occurred to me you know, the, the truth shall set you free, and that's used everywhere. Well, what truth? Oh, your sins are forgiven, and you're okay. You have a ticket. But no, no, knowing the truth that if we just obey, we don't have to worry about anything else. He'll take care of everything else. That is freedom. What more could, freedom could you want? But, I mean, that's, Amen. that verse 35 is very sobering. Amen. All this congregation. Amen. Amen. I just want to add to that. Um, Craig said it perfectly when he got up talking about leadership. Uh, I was just sharing with Robertson earlier today when I first came. Um, you know, I didn't ask for the job. I didn't ask for this position. It was something that Yahweh saw fit, and I was humble and still very humble by the opportunity to do what I do. Um, but I was saw fit to tell Rabbi, and I'm here doing what he's called me to do and I was sharing with Robinson today that I was when I first came <laughs> I was a little nervous about standing up and shouting you know uh, uh, about our anointed appointed um, I had uh, sort of you know I had a relationship with Rabbi before I came um, not an in-person one because we only met twice at feast but we would talk and I was in leadership meeting and so um because of people that were here before i came i was kind of nervous i said i didn't want to get up and say too much i'm brown i'm bald-headed and <laughs> and you know honestly i saw it for two years before we came down two and a half years i saw the 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 the, the, the ac accolades and the the the, the hoopla uh, which is all true about rabbi he is a great anointed appointed and i said well i don't want to get down and do the same thing uh even though what the guy said was true and i agree probably even more so than he did because i get to see rabbi uh you know get to work with him more closely so i would agree 100 percent. but i didn't want to be that and sure enough when i got here and actually got hired um 
one of the staff told me. He said, when I saw you coming, I said, oh, great, here comes another. He said the same thing I thought. Here comes another brown, bald-headed uh, black guy. <laughs> so I was like, gee, thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for the warm welcome. <laughs> you know, but I didn't want to be that person. I didn't want to be that guy. Uh, I just wanted to be whatever Yahweh wants me to be, and I just am who I am and remain humble, and I, I really appreciate Rabbi and all that he does for us. I'm not saying it for any other reason other than the fact that it's true. And I would say it whether I was a paid employee or if I was just a congregant. Um, he's an anointed appointed, and I appreciate it. And I'm here because he put me here through an anointed appointed. Not something I asked for, not something, you know, I can pat Rabbi on the back, I guess. My mama does. Tell that Rabbi I said thank you, give my baby a job. <laughs> That's what my mama says all the time. But I appreciate Rabbi and Rebison for, for, you know, Put me in for hiring me first of all, and then uh, you know I'm doing what I'm doing now, and all praise and glory goes to Abba. And I really appreciate Rabbi and what he does. So you know this isn't for everybody, and for the ones who run and jump and want to be in front of the mic, because that's not me. Um, my wife will tell you, I just do what I I do, <clears throat> and most of the time I do it as most of us do because there's nobody else to do it. So that's why I do what I do, and I do appreciate it. Um, and all glory goes to Abba for that. So, Craig? Yes, um, more so to the people that didn't do what they were supposed to do. Um, a lot of the children of Israel coming out of Mitzrayim were given talents that they didn't have. Um, they constructed things. Things that the ones that weren't going to be slay right after this in the next chapter. So uh, we're going to have to use uh, the priests. We're going to have to go back um, to doing their priestly roles. Um, Korak and, and everything we have coming up. It, it, um, how difficult would that be every day to know that my hands beat that gold last week. And I'm dead now. Like, it was a pretty sobering thought that I just had. Like, how looking through the photos in the back of the book, like looking at the garments, like somebody made that garment and then did this. Like, they beat that gold. They, they did everything as prescribed to the T and then did this. And it's... Um, how on guard do we have to be? Amen. Amen. As you were saying it, I thought about, you know, when I was in the church, and thanks be to Yah that I'm not anymore, but how we could somehow think, and, and we thought it because that's what we were taught. We believe what we were taught, that somehow we can do nothing but just believe after seeing all these stories of the stuff that they didn't do that he said do and got them the punishment they got, we thought just believing was good enough to make it in. They believed and didn't believe and was obedient, wasn't obedient, and, and they didn't make it. When I was talking to Rabbi about my teaching uh, prior to uh, this past Shabbat, he says from Genesis to Revelation is about the whole story is them getting ready. After the fall until the new millennium, the whole book is about getting ready, being prepared, getting prepared, learning the stories of how they failed in preparation. So the whole book is really a big preparation day. And how are you faring in it? Are you going to get weary and well-doing while you're waiting for him to return? Are we going to get lazy? Are we going to, you know, continue to be stiff-necked and self-sovereign while we're waiting? How are you preparing to get ready for his return? So I think that's a great way to end it. Um, all right. So we can get somebody to raise their hand and pray. All right. The first hand I saw was Craig. So, Craig Lane. Introducing. <laughs> so if you all rise, Craig is going to close us in prayer. And then we'll wave goodbye to everyone. We can come up here and wave goodbye. Abino Makano, our Father King, we come before you humbly thanking you for this time that we've had with your word, the intimacy that you allow us um, with yourself on a level that we um, 
do not deserve, we thank you for these lessons that our brothers, even of thousands or hundreds of years ago, had to learn for us, that we truly take to heart what they had to, to go through for us to, to see what we have and to wear these zitzi and to be um, who you called us to be. We're just thankful and we, we lift those up in prayer that are, that are sick and that are in pain and suffering and those that, that care for them and those that love them. And we just, we just thank you for all that you are and all that you allow us to be. Amen. Amen. All right. If you guys want to come up, whoever wants to come up, and we can wave goodbye and say Shavu Tov and we love you. It's Lala Tov, right? All the Tovs, we love you. Lala Tov, Shavu Tov, we love you. My wife is coming, Rebbe's, and here she come. Come on, wife. Oh, so sweet. All right. Where you gave up. <laughs> <laughs>